and yet one that we dare not let develop a familiarity with which we would despise it. Amazing love, how can it be that you, O oh God, would die for me? John chapter 3, verses 16 to 21. Thank you, Josh, for the selection of songs today. So appropriate. Helping us so to focus on this. We've already read the whole section 1 through 21 together. Just want to cite for you again this passage. That God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. I've just read to you what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. May the theme, the love of God, never grow old to us. May we never back away from it because of some theological imbalance, but embrace it as one of the greatest themes of the nature of God. You know, it's most amazing that God would love us. But that, I think that idea has lost a lot of its uh, awe and wonder. It certainly has in the culture. And there's one of several reasons. When you tell someone God loves you, they look at you like, well, why wouldn't he? You see, in the age of self-esteem and self-awareness, people are convinced that they are entitled to be loved. And if you do not love them, then there's something wrong with you. If you were to suggest that perhaps God didn't love them, then you would be tossed out on your ear. Because it's the given that we are all lovable. And then the idea of love has been distorted we talk of the love of God and, and the love of ice cream and the love of football, the love of whatever, just in the same breath and don't make any distinction. And yet, surely, they're not the same. And then I know some people, I've met them in the past, who recall against the idea of God's love and believe that it weakens the story of the gospel if you speak about the love of God for sinners. happened to me in several places. Even here, when I first got here, a fellow approached me after a sermon one Sunday morning, and he's no longer here, and he said, uh, you were really general with that idea about the love of God. I want you to be more specific and talk about how God loves his own, his people. I'm just not going to stay around here if you're going to be that general. That's a theological imbalance. In fact, Here's the point. When you understand that by nature you and I are dead in trespasses and sins, and even some who I speak to today are currently dead in trespasses and sins, deserving nothing from God but his unmitigated wrath manifested in your eternal damnation, then the suggestion that God loves you is an amazing and astounding idea. That he would love rebels that he would love sinners, that he would love traitors, that he would love those who functionally hate him. It's an astounding idea. And John carried this through, not only in the Gospel of John, but in 1 John. You need to read the letter of 1 John. I just want to point out a couple of things real quickly. 1 John 3, 1. Hear the amazement in the tone. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us 
is that it did not know him. Then further down in 1 John 3, 16, by this we know love, that he, speaking of Jesus, laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Then in chapter 4, 1 John, verses 4 to 11, 7 to 11, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, that wrath-appeasing sacrifice that covers our sins, the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. The amazing love of God. I see it in this text here in four dimensions. First, displayed in the gift of his son. Second, demonstrated in the reason for sending his son. Third, distributed to all who believe in Jesus. Fourth, differentiated between lovers of light and lovers of darkness. Look at the text. Displayed in the gift of his son, this amazing love. For God so loved didn't just love, he so loved. It's an intense love, it's an intense form of agape. It's astounding when you see the evidence of God's love that he gave, God so loved that he gave. You see, someone said you can, you can give without loving but you cannot love without giving. Love is not passive. Love is not a feeling that switches on and off depending on how people relate to us. I love you now, I don't love you. No. God so loved that he gave his only son, his uniquely begotten son, his, the, the darling of heaven, his beloved son, his, his agape toss son. Agape love intensified with that agape toss, this, this beloved son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life displayed in the gift of his son. You could stop right there. We could go home right now and meditate upon that. God so loved that he gave the best, the most precious to him. It would be like someone coming up to us on the street and asking us for a dollar and us taking, taking our wife's wedding ring off and giving them the diamond. Second, this amazing love is God is demonstrated in the reason for sending his son. Notice why he sent him. 17 says he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world is already under condemnation. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, made sure of that. When they sinned in the garden and were placed out of the garden, all of their offspring are made in their image after their likeness that is born dead in trespasses and sins. There's no reason for God to send someone to condemn the world. The world is condemned. It stands condemned. He didn't send his son for that, but the amazing reason he sent his son was in order that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. Yes, the gospel when it's preached condemns some. All it does, though, is it reminds them of where they are. The gospel doesn't put anybody under condemnation. The gospel reminds you that without Jesus Christ, if you haven't trusted him, you're under condemnation right now. No matter how good you might be, you're under condemnation right now. If you've not trusted Jesus Christ, received God's gift of love, his son, Jesus Christ. Third, the amazing love of God is distributed to all who believe in Jesus Notice, whoever believes in him is not condemned. Wait a minute, now we've, we're getting distinctions here. You can, you can be under condemnation and you can come out from under condemnation by simple faith in Christ. Trusting in Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior, saying, no longer I, Christ. Life is not about me, it's now about Jesus. Jesus, I come out of my bondage, out of my darkness, I come. If you believe in him, you're not condemned. But 
Whoever does not believe in him, that is, is condemned already. Why? What's the condemnation? What's the sin that sends you to hell? He has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Every sin will be forgiven except that one. If you go into eternity, hanging on to that one, that you've not believed, you've not confessed Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that one is not forgiven. That one takes you from condemnation to eternal judgment and wrath. Finally, the amazing love of God is differentiated between lovers of light and lovers of darkness. Watch how people act. Notice people, it'll tell you a lot. And this is the judgment. That light is coming to the world and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. You know why some people don't like to come to church? There are a lot of reasons to be sure. But one of the reasons is that people don't like to sit in a context where they are reminded that we are sinners. They don't like to come into a place where where sometimes the preacher by the Spirit of God acts as if he's been reading their mail. They don't like that. They would prefer to stay in the dark. Hide in the dark, not come to the light. That's, we in the gospel, we say, come, come to the light. Come, stare, gaze into the face of Jesus, the glory of God in his face. Look upon Jesus and they, they, they would rather stay in the dark. They'd rather hide. They love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. For everyone who practices wicked things hates the light. You've seen it before. We do it sometimes. You flip on the light in the kitchen that hasn't been, hadn't had a pest control guy through it in a while. What happens? Cockroaches. Now be afraid of the cockroach that just looks up at you when you turn on the light. Most of them scatter. People, people don't like to come to the light. And when the light of the gospel is brought to bear in certain people's lives, they run, they flinch, they turn. Lest their work should be exposed. But, here's the glorious finish. Whoever does what is true, whoever's life is practicing the truth, comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. You see, here's the difference. The people in darkness own their works and cling to their works and don't want to let go. The people in the light say, oh, look, if that was a blessing to you, then bless God. Because if there's anything good in me, it, it flows from God's love. The difference. This amazing love of God. Well, we need to wrap up so that we can go have our fellowship meal together. The, what, the, what the old writers call the love feast. What the gospel... The, the gospel writers called the love feast, the meal. Their, their meal was, was before what we call the Lord's Supper. We have the Lord's Supper and then have our love feast afterwards. I want you to go with this. What do I want you to know? That God loves sinners as sinners. You don't have to get yourself ready for Him. You don't have to get yourself good for Him. You don't have to quit sinning to come to Him. He takes care of your sin problem. He loves sinners as sinners and gave his only son to save lost sinners from their sins. With that knowledge, what do I want you to feel as you go? Well, I hope you feel astounded again by the amazing love of God for you. Never get over that. Never, never wake up the day where grace is not amazing. What do I want you to do? I want you to respond to God's love for you. For those who are Christ's followers by loving Jesus more and more. For those who are not yet Christ's followers by loving Jesus for the first time. Responding to God's love. Whoever believes in Jesus, whoever looks upon Jesus, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and says, He is the Son of God. I believe that you'll be saved. God has shown his love to sinners. I invite you today to love Jesus, God's love gift to you. Let's pray.